Welcome to the Emerging Biotech Leader, where we help biotech leaders maximize the value of their therapeutics from clinical development to product launch. We're your hosts. I'm Kim Kushner. And I'm Ramin Farhood. We are here to help you navigate the pitfalls of the biotech industry and illuminate the path forward. On today's show, we're really excited to welcome Niran Shah, who is the CEO, co-founder, and president of Cove Therapeutics. He has an incredible background in the biotech industry, having started his career actually as an MSL and really building up to now be in the CEO seat, which everyone is is always very excited to learn more about and dig into. So we're very excited to have you here near and today. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks for the invite. To start us off, can you tell us more about your your fascinating background and really your your drive to the, the CEO seat? So I'm Niran Shah. I'm a PharmD MBA by training. Um, I got my PharmD at the University of Florida, where I did my undergrad, my graduate studies, and then also did a two-year fellowship in, in uh, cardiology and cardiovascular outcomes. So during that time, I really spent a lot of you know those two years in a couple different roles. So number one, I was a lecturer as a clinical assistant professor at the University of Florida, giving you know talks about different aspects of cardiology, whether it's heart failure. AFib, hypertension, and a few other areas. And then also, secondly, I was focused on clinical research, where I was a PI or a sub-I on multiple phase two to phase four trials. We were just really fortunate as a site to take on that, you know, those types of trials. We ended up having trials from, you know, large pharma companies like Novartis, Pfizer, AstraZeneca. And then we also had some other partnerships and um, collaborations with some medium-sized uh, and smaller companies as well, including Riata and a few others. Um, so during that time, we got you know to be exposed to a number of different assets that are now approved. We got you know our patients on those drugs 15, 10 years you know prior to them getting actual market approvals. So I think those are some of the highlights of my careers um, getting you know some of those patients on drug early on. And then from there, the third thing that we ended up doing was as a group, since we were already working with these large pharma companies, we ended up taking on projects with them as well. So my fellowship director decided to spin out a brand new medical communications company. And so I was a director there focused on leading projects like KOL mapping, MSL training, and a few other aspects as well. And then from there, after I finished up my fellowship, I decided to join the industry. So Novartis was a company that we were working with, both from a clinical trial standpoint, but then also from a you know, MSL training standpoint. So I got the opportunity to become an MSL, um, moved over to California for that and took on that role for about two years. I was supporting the respiratory division, which included some rare diseases, but then also some other aspects. Admittedly, and you're going to laugh about this, but admittedly, I actually got a little bit bored um, coming from a fellowship, which was very active. And, you know, we spent a lot of time doing um, a number of different activities. So I ended up buying a restaurant at that time um, during my time as an MSL. And it was a little bit of a tangent, but at the same time, it was a great experience, and we, you know, certainly got, um, you know, the opportunity. My uh, business partner and I certainly got the opportunity to start something from scratch and really take it forward, and, and um, you know, uh, have a great time doing it as well. So then, about a year and a half later, um, I was spending a lot of time, you know, as an MSL, just supporting the respiratory division, working with KOLs. Um, the thing about big companies, as you guys probably know and appreciate, is that there's usually a person for every single role. And so to try to get some extracurricular activities, it's a little challenging. So I spent um, some time, you know, about a year or so trying to ask for other activities and um, wasn't able to get them. And so I ended up doing things on the side, like the restaurant, for example. I started my MBA program as well, um, which was something that I was doing on, on nights and weekends. And then from there, I decided to um, spin out a second restaurant. So this was a restaurant that was based on the model of the first and we um, grew, you know, both of them up. And then about a year and a half after the first one started, I ended up selling both of them. So this was right around the time that Novartis was finishing up and um, and then, you know, I got out of the restaurants as well. I actually ended up getting severed from my position at Novartis. Um, it was part of a pretty big layoff. They were closing down the medical affairs group for respiratory. And so I was one of like 50 people that got severed at the time. And then from there, I went over to NPS Pharma where I was an MSL again, supporting medical affairs but this was a different opportunity because it was a small biotech company. I was employee um, like number 125 or something like that. And during that time, I got to support several different functions, including commercial, marketing, reimbursement, 
and then towards the tail end, also supporting business development as well. And so I was getting really active in business development. That was something I really enjoyed and, and liked. But um, the company NPS Pharma, we were fortunate as a company to get two products approved. After the second got approved, we quickly got bought out by Shire for $5.2 billion. So it was a great opportunity. But for me, it was um, a little frustrating because I was stuck in the MSL role for those couple of years. And um, you know, I wanted to switch over to something like business development at the time. So a number of us after the buyout went over to PTC Therapeutics. Um, that's where I joined on the medical team again, supporting as an MSL. I was also supporting a number of the other functions, including sales, commercial, marketing. And, um, and after spending about two years there in that role, I decided to ask for a position in business development. And um, it took about six months or so, but it was a very honest, you know, transparent discussion with my you know, leadership team and then also with the CEO as well. And ultimately, we got, we got the um, opportunity to carve out a new role for me um, in that business development uh, you know, department. And so from there, I, um, you know, supported as, as the company wanted to grow out of being a small molecule only company to having a real presence and focus in gene therapy. And that's how I started getting into gene therapy. I was in a fortunate position to look under the hood on a number of different companies, both publicly traded as well as privately held and, um, got to see a lot of amazing, you know, technologies out there, the way that people were leveraging and utilizing those technologies. And then ultimately, um, you know, just fell in love with gene therapy. We ended up doing um, the deal around Agilis Biotherapeutics, which is now the home of a portfolio, which has an asset for AADC deficiency. It's now the uh, fourth ever, you know, AAV gene therapy that's been approved in the world. And that was a deal I got to work on. Um, and it was, it was absolutely phenomenal. Um, just the data in and of itself was tr transformative. And today, seeing that patients have an opportunity to get that drug, it's just been a, a remarkable miracle. So from there, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in gene therapy at that time. We looked at a number of deals. I also did some other deals um, kind of in an academic setting. We took one in from Portugal. We took one in from another group that came out of Luke Vandenberg's clinic for a gene therapy in the eye. And then so I got, you know, I got to work on those um, as well. Um, from there, I ended up leaving the business development team. I joined investor relations for about 10 months, and it was something I always you know, wanted to do and, and focus on. And it was like drinking from a fire hose because PTC was quite active on the investor front. We had, um, I think, 12 covering analysts. And so we were quite busy you know, managing that coverage, but then also working on um, you know, trying to get more investments and, and all of that as well. So. Um, did that for about 10 months and then I was thinking about starting up a non-viral gene therapy company at the time. Um, started landscaping the field with uh, a co-founder that I have today with me at Cove, but he was somebody I met through diligence uh, while I was looking at gene therapy opportunities. His name is Bill Woodward. He was the CEO and founder of Selenex, which was the AAV9 Batten disease company out of Brian Kaspar's lab. He ultimately sold that to Amicus, but that was something I did a lot of diligence on created a great relationship with Bill, and um, today he's my you know, co-founder in Cove. But we set out to do a lot of landscaping in the field for non-viral. We looked at all sorts of different technologies, exosomes, we looked at LMPs, and then we looked at polymeric nanoparticles as well. And then ultimately we landed on you know, this, this project that we're working on now, but it took some time to get there. And so in the meantime, you know, as, I was, as I was finishing up um, my role in investor relations at PTC Therapeutics, I got the opportunity to reconnect with somebody I've always looked up to and thought of as a mentor in RA session, um, who was just starting up Tasia Gene Therapies at the time. And so I, you know, reached out to him. I told him that I was looking to start up a company called Cove Therapeutics, which is non-viral. He said, this is great, but um, why don't you join my company instead? It's called Tasia Gene Therapies. It's the portfolio out of Stephen Gray's, um, you know, office and clinic. And I said, that's great. You know, that's one of the uh, portfolios that we looked at, at at PTC as well. So I decided to join there. I was employee number three, um, part of the executive management team. I led operations, which included uh, program management, uh, alliance management, and then uh, was also doing a number of other things like supporting the IPO, which included things like communications and investor relations as well. So it was quite a busy role, especially as we were getting um, up and running. The, the mission and the vision for Tasia was always to have a large portfolio of gene therapy assets and really leverage you know, the underlying platform, which was the strength around 
our manufacturing process and then the strength around you know designing these really credible assets from Stephen Gray's lab. So as we were supporting that IPO, we still had to execute and there was only about 10 of us that were at the company at the time through the IPO. So we decided to um, you know focus on the IPO but then also outsource and you know kind of pull you guys in. That's where I met you know you you and SSI. So we pulled you guys in and um, you know you guys were integral to us getting the the GM2 CTA opened up as well as some other activities too. So I'm always absolutely grateful for that. Um, in the meantime, I was always transparent with Ari about you know starting up Cove, and you know after I spent about a year and a half at Tasia Gene Therapies last year, I officially left and uh, started up Cove. We finished up the license with Johns Hopkins University, uh, really around this polymeric nanoparticle technology that comes from the Langer Lab and the office of uh, Jordan Green and Peter Campuchario. Um, so that's where we are today. I'm happy to dig in more on Cove, but let me let me stop there. Yeah, and it's such an incredible story going from MSL to CEO, somehow fitting a restaurant and an MBA in the mix is incredible to me. Tell me, in that transition, at what point did you feel ready to take on the CEO role? It, I think you, you tell it really well on, on how you decided to evolve from the medical affairs role, which is incredibly hard. And, and we're working with clients all the time who are trying to ask that question, how do I get, you know, an, an in-house role in the company? How do I evolve my position? How do I start to build some of that business acumen? You did all of those things and it, a relatively short career. You're not, you know, late in your career by any means. So being a young CEO, what was the impetus to make that shift? And I know you, you've had a lot of those candid conversations with RA really early on in your position at Taisha, which is fantastic. But how did you decide that it was time to make that leap and, and take on this role? It's a great question. I don't know if you're ever really sure you're ready. Um, I think that's the best way to answer that question. But I've been really fortunate. I mean, you know, even you know, spanning back to my fellowship, I've always been around people that I've looked up to, um, like a person like Ben Epstein, for example, was a big KOL in the field as a PharmD. It's hard to become a KOL as a PharmD, but that's something that he was able to do. And then he started up a company on his own that was very successful as well. So even from my early days, I got to see what success looked like and, um, you know, got a chance to mimic it in the restaurants, which was a small business, but, you know, got a chance to take that risk. And I, at the time, as, as you can imagine, um, I scraped together what little money I had from a fellowship and a, and a graduate program. So I, I you know, um, decided to start it up. It was ultra risky, but that's usually when you put your heart and soul into something, when you feel like it's risky, when you feel like it's an outsized opportunity, you really go for it. And so, um, you know, spanning forward, I, I, after the restaurants, one thing I didn't mention was that I really got a chance to be around a lot of other CEOs and founders as well. I started doing a lot of investing and working with founders and CEOs as an advisor to their young biotech companies or to their uh, non-biotech technology companies. And so um, got a chance to sit on some boards, got a chance to be an advisor. And as a result, I, I really got to see what worked, what didn't work. And I met some amazing founders along the way as well. So I've always been around, you know, that sort of environment. And I think that really is, is very helpful. I think one philosophy that I've always had in my life is that if you're getting bored, that means you need to add something onto your plate. And so I've always felt um, very, very much in that, in that regard. But then also, you know, having the experience that comes from drinking from a fire hose in multiple different positions really helps to, you know, accelerate that pathway as well. And so you do have to look out and seek out opportunities to create your own pathways. And you always have to, um, you know, ask who's working on what. Be, be a little bit of a bother, see if you can help somebody you know, from a commercial team, if you're in a medical affairs department, see if you can help out somebody on a business development team. Uh, those are things that I've always done throughout my career. I've never really expected anything in return, but it's always been something that's been a lot of fun. And I've get I've gotten to learn from, you know, what I feel is some of the best people that I, I've, you know, run into in the field. And then from there, having the opportunity to go and work at Tasia, like before Tasia, I felt like I was ready for Cove. But then after Tasia, I felt even more ready because you know, there was a year and a half of what, you know, was a, a really fast paced environment um, with Tasia. We took that company from seed to IPO in just about six months. And so you can imagine that while, you know, managing a, an IPO process, but then also trying to work on 15 or 17 different programs as we were getting ready for the IPO 
was quite a challenge. And so, you know, that's something that uh, you, you learn how to, you know, manage and juggle those things as well. But that's what I really owe um, to, to be ready for a role like Cove now. And, you know, I think the other thing was that, you know, as you think about the field and where it's heading, you also have to think about, you know, what's going to be the future of gene therapy. And so for me, I've gotten a chance to look under the hood on, you know, so many different companies. And I found the same challenges over and over. It's either a biological challenge with AAVs. It's either a manufacturing challenge. Now we're starting to see some regulatory hurdles as well. And as a consequence of that, um, you know, I really was looking for a next technology that can overcome those limitations that can help us conceive, you know, a commercial product of mine and work backwards from there. Yeah, we may not have the clinical, you know, proof of concept that some of these AAV9 or AAV8, for example, does, but it's something that we're building towards. And, you know, if we can show that uh, clinical proof of concept that someday, um, you know, I think we'll be well positioned to, to have a technology that we can take forward that's really, truly going to enable commercial success. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Nira. And your story is very inspiring. And thank you for sharing that with us. And it looks like it, it was all kind of like jammed within a decade in your career. It sounds like, as Kim was saying, that usually people go through this throughout their entire career, not, not just in 10, 10 plus years. So uh, definitely kudos to you. I want to shift our conversation a little bit and focusing on you as a CEO and the early build, especially the medical office uh, early build. Um, you have a reputation um, that you are very research, resourceful and also you get things done, you get, you get results. How do you, how do you do that? How do you think about building your medical office with the limited resources and it's still accomplishing what you need to accomplish to get to the next phase? Uh, what are some of the thoughts that goes to your head, especially with all the changes going on in gene therapy? Uh, what, what, what have you start doing maybe differently that maybe a year ago or a couple of years ago now as a CEO of Cove? Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of things that we've done here at Cove to um, think about our medical office. And so, you know, in this market, it is a little challenging to raise money. We're fortunate that we raised some money last year. So we're working off that. We have the runway for it as well. So we haven't, you know, decided to hire out a big team yet. Um, we are truly focused on development and translational activities right now. So that's, you know, kind of where our mind's at from a development standpoint. But as we think about the medical office, you know, it's something that you um, want to start thinking about as soon as you start a company, obviously for translational activities, but then also thinking forward, you know, how are we going to get into the clinic? How are we going to answer those important questions? So we've been fortunate as we founded this company with Dr. Jordan Green. Um, we also got a chance to work with Dr. Peter Campachario, who is a leading clinician scientist. He's a big KOL in the field, and especially around the space of the eye, which is where we're focused right now as a gene therapy company. So we're leaning on his years of experience, um, both as an entrepreneur, as well as a leading clinician scientist to really fill a lot of gaps for us on the translational side. In addition to that, we're also leveraging outsourced um, you know, uh, firms such as SSI Strategy, who's now an investor as well as a uh, outsourced firm for us. Um, but we've been really privileged to work with you guys because I think you guys are seeing a lot in gene therapy today, having been behind, you know, a number of uh, very promising gene therapy companies, some that have, you know, taken it all the way to commercial success. So we're leveraging that expertise. And then we're also stacking the board as well as our SAV with people that are very familiar with gene therapy, uh, familiar with the diseases that we're going after. Um, and trying to treat. But for example, we have Sukhan Nagendran, who's on our board. He's an investor of ours, has deep experience serving as a CMO at some leading gene therapy companies. Um, we also have some folks on our SAB that are absolutely very talented in the diseases that we're going after, both from a clinical perspective as well as a molecular biology perspective as well. So it's our goal to you know, stack the books in terms of medical support early on. I've always found that, you know, having a CMO who's really good can make the difference for you. I've been very privileged, both at MPS as well as, you know, PTC as well as Tasia. We've had some really strong, you know, medical presence in, in all of our groups. And as a consequence of that, um, you know, I see, I see how it works when it goes right. <laughs> you know? and, and so we're really focused on, you know, identifying the right CMO when that time comes. The types of CMOs that we're looking for now are people that have deep gene therapy experience. We're looking for people that have viral experience who understand the challenges of viral, um, that want to come over and you know solve some of those problems from a non-viral perspective. And then also people that have experience in the eye as well. That is our first franchise that we're going after. 
And so it's not, you know, we're, we're casting this wide net, but it's also a very, you know, specific, um, you know, talent that we're looking for as well. And do you think, Naren, coming from a medical side, and especially being an MSL, uh, medical communication, academia, I mean, obviously your, your career in the past 10 plus years has been really uh, anchored on the medical and science side. That gives you a different perspective on when you are building a CMO office or a medical office, what type of profile you look for, for a CMO and, and some of the other functions within the CMO. Does that, does that you think, is what's the advantage for you or different perspective that perhaps maybe somebody who hasn't gone that path will have a different perspective on it? You know, as I think about the MSL role, one of the key aspects of that role is managing relationships and getting outcomes, whether it's, you know, getting somebody to write an investigator initiated study, whether it's to you know, get somebody to understand your product better, whether it's just, you know, simple education and running ad boards. But from all of those activities, I think one underlying theme is managing relationships with these, you know, up and coming um, KOLs or established KOLs, for example. And that's something that uh, we've been fortunate here at Cove. We've gotten great folks involved in the story. These are people that are very credible in the, in, you know, in the field. And um, part of that, I think, is, is working on building relationships with them. It's helping them understand what we're trying to do for patients at the end of the day. It's helping them understand our vision and our mission, letting them be a part of it, and then also helping to um, you know, work with them on some of the challenges that they're facing as well. There might be things that we're working on that can help bridge. So for example, one of our SAB members is working on an editing program. And even though we're DNA delivery and DNA replacement at the moment, we are thinking about starting a collaboration that looks at using our polymers with their editing program. It's something that they've wanted to take forward for a long time. And now this could be a perfect marriage between technologies and underlying, you know, biologies and approach. So it's, it's managing, it's, you know, creating a win-win situation for everybody on the team. And that's, that's how we look at everything that we do here at Cove. Let's talk about Cove a little bit. And I know Cove is addressing the retinal diseases and blindness we are a very unique and differentiated technology. Uh, and as a result of that, you are able to have big advantages on the CMC costs and some cost savings there. How, how does that saving uh, benefit the overall program, the funding, your runway that you talked about a minute before, and, and ultimately the patients? You know, one of the things that really attracted me, attracted me to the non-viral side is this idea that you can now start to have a scalable manufacturing process that you can do rapidly, very cheaply, and very efficiently and reproducibly as well. So those are the things that we looked for as Bill and I you know, sought out different opportunities from a non-viral standpoint. And we came across Dr. Jordan Green's work. Um, it was just fortuitous in terms of timing. We actually met Dr. Jordan Green uh, right ahead of a big publication that he was going to put out that showed that his nanoparticles using a suprachoroidal route administration really transfected the retinal cells, both the photoreceptors and the RPE cells. And so when we saw this technology, we, we quickly moved to try to get the license done um, before that publication came out. We were about halfway successful. Um, it took a while for us to get that license done, but it was something that uh, you know we, we worked on for roughly about 10 months or so. Um, so going back to your, your question about the cost, it is something that, you know, we feel like we can move rapidly because if you think about um, non-viral, most of the non-viral fail failures in the past, you know, call it the last two, three decades or, or so, for example, have all been due to um, not being able to translate to higher level species. And so now we have those data and we've shown that we can do that. But I think it's really combining the technology around the nanoparticle, one that we know can you know, transfect these cells very cell specifically. We don't use any targeting ligands. So there's no moieties, there's no uh, ligands, for example, there's no CPPs or antibodies in any of our constructs. And so that's where we um, save a lot of, you know, money in terms of uh, manufacturing cost. What goes into our manufacturing system is simply the polymer and then the DNA itself. And does that also help with the speed of the manufacturing as well? Absolutely. Yeah. So when you think about uh, adding things like antibodies, it does create a little bit of a complex manufacturing system. So, you know, you start to lose that reproducibility, you start to lose a little bit of control over that process. And so for us, because we're not using that and ultimately going into the eye, we're also using less materials than if we were, you know, delivering systemically, for example. 
So for all those reasons, we're, um, we're highly efficient. We can put together products that we can, you know, develop and test side by side on a research grade, um, you know, basis within, within just weeks. And so we can have five constructs to test side by side. And that's how we're really de-risking. You know, we might not have clinical proof of concept at the table today with these polymers, but what we do know is that we can de-risk because we can move quickly, you know, be able to uh, compare and contrast side by side several constructs and then take forward our favorites. Um, and we can even do those in parallel with multiple constructs, something that, you know, has been difficult in the past with viral gene therapy. So for all those reasons, that's how we're um, moving quickly. And that's also why we don't have to hire a massive team tomorrow and, you know, have, have to worry about all of these uh, bottlenecks in viral gene therapy today. I guess just to, to summarize some of those points then, Aaron, you're really getting at a couple of key differentiators for what you're building. It's the manufacturing costs shifting away from some of the challenges in viral gene therapy, where we know the market has been facing a lot of uphill battles over the last couple of years. And unfortunately, they keep popping up left and right. You're being really thoughtful about building your team to try to complement the skills and kind of leverage partners as much as you possibly can. Um, how are you starting to translate some of that to the investor community and in, in your investment thesis? So I, I love going back to your original story where you got a little bit bored and you decided to start a restaurant. I assume that was one of your earliest forays into thinking about the investment community and really building that story. What did you learn from telling a story and building a restaurant to what you're dealing with with investors now and how you're telling Cove's story? What's really differentiating your business, your narrative, and your thesis when you're in the market? So for us, I mean, there's there's a lot of advantages of a non-viral platform as it you know relates to gene therapy today. So for example, we are cell-specific nanoparticles. So what that means is that we don't, again, we don't use any targeting ligands or CPPs or antibodies to target these cells. We actually get cell engagement at that very specific level um, without using any of those moieties, for example. That's number one. We've also delivered a large menu of different cargoes. So now we have proof and evidence and publications that support the use of our polymers delivering DNA, mRNA, and then also knockdown approaches, things like miRNA, siRNA, and CRISPR. Um, beyond that, we are biodegradable. So these polymers, once they enter into the cell, they quickly biodegrade within just hours to days. This is contrast compared to you know, other polymeric nanoparticles that are in the space today, as well as some LNPs as well where they tend to accumulate within the cell and then over time they can cause cytotoxicity. This really limits that, you know, that really tantalizing view on redosing down the road one day. So for us, we've done um, some experiments where we've looked at our polymers and cell lines and, you know, in vivo as well. We're not seeing the immunogenicity profile that we would typically see in a, in a viral gene therapy, for example. Um, it's something that's very tolerable, something that's very acceptable as a clinical candidate. And so we've nominated, you know, our favorite polymer to take forward as on that basis. Um, we've also done some redosing experiments, as you know, with gene therapy today, at least the way it rests today is that, you know, you do have to get it right on the first time and you don't really have the opportunity to go back and redose these patients over and over again. And so for diseases, as you can think about, um, that have a narrow therapeutic window that have a tight expression, you know, window, for example, those are ones where we can now start slowly and titrate into the therapeutic window that we need to get to. And so for that basis, we've done some redosing experiments. We know that we can get to levels that rival viruses now. So imagine all these benefits that you get from a non-viral perspective, but then being able to rival viral expression anyways. Um, so that's where we are today. And um, you know, those are some of the advantages. And then lastly, we talked a little bit about this as well, but the manufacturing um, has been a huge uh, you, you know, thing that we've, um, started to explore and, you know, we're getting closer and closer to GMP grade materials now. And so it's something that we're, we're quite excited about as we, you know, start to ramp towards the clinic. So you're absolutely differentiating yourself scientifically from the gene therapy space as it stands today, building something new that, that truly differentiates the, the assets and the, and the platform that you're building against. How have you approached telling that story and, and building the syndicate for your A round? So as you mentioned, you you closed funding last year. You were fortunate enough not to have to, to go through that in 2022, which has been a painful process for many. Tell us how you went through that process as a, a first-time CEO. We, we called on our syndicate for the A round. We were looking at really strategic investors for the A round, so, and we got just that. So we, we got um, Chardon involved, or many of the leaders from Chardon involved 
in the A round, we have Sukhanagandaran involved, and then we have SSI strategy involved as well. So what we wanted to do for the A round in particular was invite people that we knew we trusted um, who had deep experience in gene therapy. Uh, we had no idea 2022 was going to look the way it does right now. So um, we were lucky to close up that seed round last November. And, you, you know, we've been able to leverage our network and our investors to um, really get the best and latest insights on what's going on in the gene therapy field, and then also get expertise as we move forward, you know, some of these programs as well. So that's how we ultimately wanted to build that seed round syndicate, people that, you know, wanted to have skin in the game, people that were willing to roll up their sleeves and help us out as, as we continue to grow. And as we think about um, the syndicate for the Series A as well, you know, we really um, are, are excited about some of the folks that we're talking to right now, just lining up that Series A process um, as we, you know, think about launching that as well. And so um, what we want to do there is have a syndicate that's really focused on um, some, you know, tier one VC, for example, that's got, you know, a lot of experience in gene therapy and, and biotech in general. Um, but then we also want folks that are involved from a strategic standpoint. So we've, you know, started to talk to some strategics as well. And, um, you know, those are folks that we hope to get involved in the, in the Series A process. And then lastly, we hope to get um, folks that are involved from a disease standpoint. So um, there are foundations out there that are overlining and or, or over, um, overlapping with us in terms of some of the disease areas. So we hope to get them involved in the story as well. One of the things that we want to build as part of our culture at Cove is, you know, having a real focus on patients. And, um, you know, I, I think one way to do that is to get some of these groups involved and having them, you know, be an advocate for us as we continue to, to move forward. It takes a village, as you guys know. And, um, you know, we're certainly excited about some of the folks that we're talking to right now. One last question, I guess, on that front. When we, when we think about focusing on the patient and which groups you're targeting, how are you balancing the focus of your narrative for investors relative to the platform versus a specific product or a specific asset that you're bringing forth? I know that's a big challenge for a lot of companies, especially early biotech companies. You really deep dive heavily into the value of the platform you're bringing to market, which, you know, for all of the scientific reasons you just talked through, you have an amazing platform in front of you. How are you differentiating between focusing on that versus the near-term priorities, which are really your retinal franchise and, and building that up for the organization? It's something that, you know, over the last few months, we've learned different investors have different appetites. So certain investors really want to see us take forward a platform today, right? They want to see data in the heart, they want to see data in the brain, they want to see data in your left toe, right? They're, they're looking for it all, right? Um, and and then we talk to other investors who really want us to focus on one franchise. And so it just depends. I think what we're looking for as we talk to investors is somebody who understands, you know, where we are as a company, um, where we are as a team, as a size. And we are a small company. We have about, you know, a, a little less than 10 employees in the company right now. Um, but, but we are heavily focused on the I franchise. And so um, what we're asking investors as they review the story is really focusing on the I as, a, as an underwriting thesis for us. Um, we've stacked up our SAV as, as, a, you know, as a mirror of everything that we're doing in the I. And we also have a device that I didn't mention earlier, but this is a device that gets us into the suprachoroidal space, which is different than a subretinal injection or an intravitreal injection, for example. Um, and so because of that device, you know, there's a lot of resources that will ultimately go towards having a drug device combination. And so as, as we, you know, think about the Series A and think about positioning it, it's really, um, you know, us asking investors to focus in on the I franchise, for example, as a first leading franchise. And then for us as a second franchise, we're going to go into the muscle. And then beyond that, we have data already with our polymers and other tissues as well. So you know, we're going step by step here. I, you know, I've been a part of companies where we've done a lot and, you know, it's great in a great market, but it's also really difficult in a, in a tough market like the one that we're in today. So our thesis as we're uh, moving forward is to be really pragmatic about our approach, really focus in on, you know, the I franchise, which, which is an outsized opportunity. I think everybody agrees that there are highly prevalent indications, you know, whether you're looking at a non-orphan disease or whether you're looking at an orphan disease, they're still, you know, highly prevalent populations in both groups. And so for us, because we can manufacture already, knowing that we can address all those populations, it just makes a lot of sense for us to go into the eye. It's something that's a low hanging fruit for us in terms of de-risking the technology. 
de-risking the, the device, which gives us, you know, competitive advantage. That's that's how we're taking it forward. That's where we see the strength in the story today. And uh, it seems like you're being very selective, especially in this market, as, as you mentioned, maybe a few years ago, it was a slightly different. Uh, you've been very selective and hyper-focused on what it's, what is the most important right now with the highest priority, and then kind of built on that as opposed to try to have a wider net and, and catch everything all at the same time. Um, this has been a great session. Um, I do want to ask you one, one last question. And this is a really important question because I know a lot of our listeners are kind of listening to you. They're getting inspired and, and they are thinking, about, well, how, how can I, what would be the advice? They're thinking that, how can I do that? How can I duplicate what Niran has done, right, in my own career? And what, what type of advice would you have with somebody maybe early on or maybe mid-career, right, um, that they should be thinking about in order to kind of get in the same path that you have been or a similar path? Uh, what, what would you suggest? What are the one or two things that comes to your mind that is critical? I mean, for me, you know, if you seek out opportunities, you'll get them, right? I think that's one thing you just have to be willing to um, continue to work on. Like no is not an answer. I think if you really want it, you can go after it and get it. It's just a matter of time. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than you want to. In my case, it took, you know, several years before I got into the BD role that I wanted to be in. Um, and then also, as you seek out those opportunities, along the way, you're going to find great mentors. Um, it comes, you know, it comes with the territory of seeking out great opportunities. And so keep those mentors close. Like I never thought RA Session was going to be somebody I'd work for one day. But here, you know, I worked for him for about a year and a half and it was a fantastic year. We, we got to do a lot together. Um, but, you know, I didn't mention this. He actually interviewed me at PTC a long time ago. So that's how I ended up meeting him. Um, always kept in touch with him and then always kept in touch with several of my other mentors as well. And um, now I'm in a position to be able to work with them side by side. And so it's been, uh, you know, it's been a real pleasure seeing them in action, seeing, you know, those opportunities, you know, grow as a result. So for anybody that's looking to, you know, scale out of the role that they're in today, look for other roles. I think um, be willing to take on opportunities, even if it's on your own time, nights, weekends, don't expect anything in return. And, um, you know, always look out for great mentors. There, There's a lot of them out there. And, you know, for anybody that's interested, I'm happy to be a, a mentor as well. Well, uh, Niren, thank you very much. This was a, this was a wonderful episode. Uh, thanks for coming and thanks for sharing your your thoughts and your learnings uh, with us. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ramin. Thanks, Kim. It's been a pleasure working with you guys, and thanks for the invite on this on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for tuning in to the Emerging Biotech Leader, an SSI strategy podcast. Join us each month for more conversations with biotech leaders. If you'd like to help navigating the complexities of biotech, reach out to our team at ssistrategy.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review.